So congrats on the amazing documentary, guys. How does it feel to have it finally complete? Gary, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, it just feels amazing, to be honest. I've, you know, we've kind of worked on this for four years. Um, well, coming to four years. And obviously the post-production has been kind of such a massive kind of like whirlwind. Obviously, we screen marks coming on board and then re-editing after, after six years. So it's just great now to finally speak to people who have watched it because we've we've been glued to that screen for the edit and now getting feedback is just it's always a scary part you know when you you know you create anything isn't the feedback you get and it's just it's just a, a kind of an amazing experience that people are actually really enjoying it so it's uh, we're on a high at the moment um i'm sure there'll be a couple of people who uh don't don't like it like like most things but we're really happy that robert loves it and that's that's really important that robert you know, shed a tear when he watched it. So that's important to me, Chris and Adam, I think very much so. And what about you, Chris? Yeah, same for Gary. Because, uh, of course, we were chatting about Pennywise, weren't we, uh, just about this time last year? Yeah. And in all cases, you know, we've had this <laughs> backlog of work that's been haunting us. You know, was, we, ha we haven't reached that celebrity status yet. We can't take this full-time, got the full-time job. So when you know you're like, Shit, there's Pennywise to get finished up. Oh, God, there's the Rob Engel one. Oh, no, there's RoboDoc as well. You know, <laughs> for each one that comes off, I feel that massive relief on my shoulders. But this one's been, um, to be honest, by comparison to the other two mentioned, um, the, the, the breeziest process uh, okay. you could possibly imagine by comparison. Um, how did this project come about? Is this something that you guys were developing from the ground up? Or were you approached to make this film? Gary? No, it's, it's very much come from obviously ourselves. You know, I've been a fan, and like Chris has as well, of course, I've been a fan of Robert since I was a very young child. You know, I was allowed to have horror films. You know, I was allowed to watch A Night on Elm Street. I had a poster of Freddie Krueger on my bedroom wall. So it was all something he wanted to do. You know, I wanted to work with Robert somehow, trying to find how we could work with him. Obviously, we'd done the documentaries ourselves before, which obviously were successful. And we always wanted to do something narrative about someone's career. So I kind of pitched to Chris first, going, how do you feel about doing a doc about a career, which we both agreed to, and then about Robert. Uh, and then it was literally trying to get hold of Robert, you know, trying to get through to him and convince him we were the right people to chart his life. And lucky enough, we went through Nancy's wife, Nancy England, and um, she obviously must have liked us because she sent the message into Robert, and then it was a phone call with Robert and then a pitch. And then next thing you know, we're in London and we're having a meal with him, discussing the project. And it just went, obviously, again, a roller coaster ride from there. But again, I think Robert appreciated we were film fans and we loved his work. Um, that was probably the very short version of a very long story. <laughs> it seems like he really enjoys fame and really enjoys connecting with the horror community. Is that something that you guys picked up on, Chris? Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it's interesting. So when when we were doing, because um, Gary kind of led on this project in the first instance, and then I just came in and said, "No, I'm taking over it." No, it wasn't like that. We but we kind of, you know, we we got closer and closer on this project to becoming co-directors. But I think one of the things I found a bit challenging in the first instance on this topic is, you know, okay, this is the first time we've taken on the challenge of chronicling someone's career rather than just you know deep dive on a film. Um, so I've been very conscious of like, what's what's the narrative? You know, it's it's all well and good to kind of go, oh, is this film, this film, that show, this film. But I was always looking for like the dichotomy of like, what, what's kind of like a hook we can have? And the biggest thing I think we were able to achieve because there's no drama in Robert's life per se. No, no, no extraordinary thing like, let's say, Kane Hodder's stunt accident that, you know, gave him um, the scars. Uh, the main thing we kind of went with was the the, the balance of blessing and the curse of a role. And I think that's what I found kind of quite interesting was, uh, you know, how we were able to kind of tap in a little bit and get some candid uh, viewpoints from Robert about, you know, at times he was second guessing, was it a clever idea to take on Freddie? You know, I'm, I'm attached, I'm stuck to this role now. But I think what I love, you know, and it is absolutely sincere, is, you know, particularly at the end is by uh, him saying, by embracing this genre, I've, you know, I've stuck with it. I've gone from being the, you know, the antagonist to now the old man that spins the tales or the scientist or something like that. So it's, he absolutely does. And we've witnessed firsthand. I mean, watching him when we had the screening in Sitches uh, last year and, you know, getting to hang out with him and everything, he gets mobbed by people. And no matter how big he is and what he's done, 
he will still stop for virtually every person who encounters him for an autograph without hesitation. And, you know, how he, <laughs> it really puts into perspective how much I've got to try and get fit because if he's able to do that, I don't think I could even at this age now. So um, he, he loves it, you know, and you hear all the stories. And I think hopefully we've reflected that in this film. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people seem to have said, oh, you know, this is this. Yeah, that is Robert. But, you know, at conventions, he's notorious for having these huge queues because it's not a sign next, sign next. He will talk to these people for a good few minutes a pop. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's just a testament to his character. Gary, how would you describe his relationship with the horror community? I think he's just embraced it massively. And I think, you know, he's, he learned a long time ago about how important the fans are to his legacy, you know. And mm -hmm. the weird thing about Robert is he's very kind of shy, I think, still in, he doesn't like, he, you know, for example, when we called the original documentary, it was called Icon, Robert was concerned about that. He said, I'm not an icon, you know, and he seems very egotistical, same, and like, Robert, you are. And he came with the idea of Hollywood dreams and nightmares, which I like actually is a better title mm -hmm. now. Uh, it was easy to say icon, uh, but I think Robert has really embraced the fans. And I think, you know, we've been talking quite a lot this weekend. We were at a convention ourselves over the weekend in the UK. And we were talking about how, you know, for a fan, meeting that person is everything, you know, that moment in time. And it's only a few minutes sometimes. That means the absolute world to that person. But for the person inside of the table, it's another person, you know, in the sign autograph forum. Robert is really good at making you feel special. Mm -hmm. and making you feel and making you always remember that moment and when you look at that photograph later on you gush over it and you talk to your friends about it and you talk about the experience i don't think i've ever read one single comment online about robert england being negative not one single comment where you know you sometimes get it about other actors who are just tired on that day you had a bad day you know and they may have not smiled at the right time or looked a bit grumpy on a photograph whereas i think robert has embraced the fandom embraced the genre he feels himself as a spokesperson for the genre, you know, and as Chris said, he's now playing the roles of the elder statesman and, and the doctor and the scientist, and he loves that. And I think for him to appreciate and embrace it, it makes it not a curse anymore. It makes it a blessing and it mm -hmm. makes him, you know, he's up there now very much for us with Christopher Lee, Lugosi and, you know, Cushing and Vincent Price. You know, your Doug Bradleys are brilliant and your Kane Harders are amazing. But I think they're in one section of that, of one shelf, you know, and he's on the upper shelf, really, with the original icons of horror. I think he's the last. He's the, late, he's the last great icon. I really think he is. You know, and I, I think I'm, I love the fact that people like, you know, the guy who plays Art, the clan, David. I think he's brilliant. But he's becoming, you know, a part of that gang. He's a new generation. Unlike, you know, as Chris said earlier on, another interview, like you saw people sort of like that. He's now becoming like the cartoon character and the, the T-shirt Art the Clown is. But Robert and Freddy will, are sitting there with Dracula and Frankenstein and, you know, the you know, Invisible Man. That's what I think he, you know, I went on a bit too long and sorry, but I think that's where Robert has embraced that. I did a Chris then. I've talked for ages. <laughs> well, speaking of icons, you interviewed so many horror royalty individuals here. Was there ever a moment you were starstruck? Who were some of the interview highlights for you guys? Chris, I'll start with you. Oh, there's there's a good there's a good good few to be fair. I mean, I I don't want to poo poo any of them. I wasn't there for Tony Todd's, which really sucked. So I got a uh, Kane Hodder over in the UK, which Whoa. was awesome. Um, so I, and chatting to him about the Friday Thirteenth game was so much fun, and the amount of hours of my life I've wasted playing that. Me too. Um, and then. Um, I think to be honest, it was it was Lance Henriksen is that moment I just really remember where you know he was running a bit late and anxiety. The thing I always say this right, I absolutely appreciate all these people we meet. You know, I'm so excited, but I'm glad in a way I've got that thing, you know, inherent thing where when we're filming an interview and we you know we're there to do a job basically, that kind of takes over. And I kind of want to kick my own ass to be like, no, no, make sure you're absorbing this, that you sat opposite this person. But I think it was Lance Henriksen when, you know, you're waiting there. You're like, oh, my God, it's Lance. And you see a car go past. Like, oh, my God, it's him, it's him. And I think <laughs> people like um, those guys you see on the, the tarmac at an airport guiding him into the car park, like, this way, this way. And oh, welcome, sir. And he just stepped out the car and he was Lance Henriksen, as I certainly know him now. Mm. since doing the interview but at the time i'm like oh my god it's bishop oh my god uh, 
And it, 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 I think he sort of stepped out. I think he might have had a, had a cigarette in his mouth, like, oh, I got fucking caught up on the, 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 the way. And it's like, that's Lance Henriksen. And then, you know, you're just kind of walking behind him with your jaw on the floor. And then, so yeah, that, but so many people, Lynn mm-hmm. Shea. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to stop myself there and I'm going to let Gary sort of throw in yeah, I, names Gary now. Had, well, I also want to say Lynn Shea is one of my all timers. So it was great seeing her there. But Gary, how about you? Uh, for me, I mean, again, there's lists of people like Tony Todd's and Bill Mosley's and whatnot. But I, one what I really enjoyed the most, and oh, was yeah. sorry, my dog's agreeing with me now, uh, was uh, Andrew Diver. I think he doesn't get, he's, he's, he reminds me of Robert a lot because he's very elegant, he's very well spoken, he's very thoughtful. Obviously, you know, he had Wishmaster, but I remember from a film called Toy Soldiers back in the day with, um, Sean Astin and it was like a, as a kid watching that where the terrorists take over a school was just ridiculous so when he walked through a door I was just I was really expecting the real I, I can put this in the nicest way a horrible person I don't know why I just I, I thought oh he's gonna be he's gonna be a nightmare he's gonna be a pain he's got that heart. cold look about him hasn't yeah, he has yeah, yeah. I, I remember him being he was in lost as well with the eye patch wasn't he he walked in he was a nicest genuinely nicest person I think you know we were well, one of them we've ever met and I just kind of warmed to him straight away. So I, I loved meeting him for the first time. Mm-hmm. And he's not in the dock a lot, which is a shame, really, because obviously we only could wish Master very briefly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's somebody I'd like to meet again and that, you know have a drink with. Uh, but yeah, there's obviously everybody else, as Chris said, you know, you know, Eli Roth was amazing to meet and Adam Green, I really liked him. Uh, but again, it's, it's really weird, like probably for yourself, when you meet these people, you're not in fan mode most of the time because you're so worried about the project and worried about getting an interview done and worried about the time. You've got an hour. You forget, really, until, until you get home and look at the photographs and go, shit, you know, that was so-and-so. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's kind of, and we're, we're all kind of dogs at this now. We are really, me and Chris, you know, it's probably interviewed over 200 people probably for our documentary. So it's just, it's a strange kind of feeling now when it used to be back when we were younger, meeting people for the first time. I thought that I knew basically every film from his filmography and I was wrong. And I'm just wondering... <laughs> Did you guys discover anything new making this film from Robert's filmography? And maybe like, what are some underseen gems that fans should seek out? I think for me, this is that this is being really honest now. It was anything before, really, in the 1980s okay. I hadn't seen, you know, and I hadn't had an interest in seeing as much as I love Robert. For me, it's always a horror genre. It just always has been. I'm a huge horror fan. Chris has got a lot more better taste in films than I have. My, you know, Chris's dad is, is an aficionado of all kinds of types of film. I think that's really rubbed off on Chris. Whereas me, with my family were horror, 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 you know what I mean? They were all mm-hmm. cheesy British comedies, you know, raunchy comedies. So for me to go and explore films like Buster and Billy and yeah. Stay Hungry, I'd never watched. That was the gems for me where I went, shit, this, you know, this is a different kind of... I knew about Willie, the character in V, uh, but and I knew it was a different, completely polar opposite to Freddy. Mm-hmm. But then when you look at people, the characters he played in in Buster and Billy, particularly, and you know the the uh, films after that, this is a you know redneck sidekick kind of like really kind of like you know simple kind of character in the sense of compared to Freddy. So that was the big, biggest kind of draw for me, and I and, and I hope people watch it like we have and gone. I'm gonna check that film out. You know, I'm gonna try and find it online, try and find Stay Hungry. But again, as I said, Chris has, Chris is a lot better filmography uh, than I have in terms of obviously he's he's kind of like um, repertoire of films haven't you Chris and me what about you Chris did you discover anything new um in terms of the films not a great deal actually I'll admit I've never seen 2001 Maniacs before we did this and I actually really enjoyed it because oh, you know what it's amazing to think now that's actually kind of nostalgic I do feel a lot of nostalgia for early 2000s horror films in particular like you know the remake era of Chainsaw Massacre and 2001 Maniacs in terms of anecdotes, uh, yeah, the 70s stuff, I've always been a fan of Stay Hungry and The Big Wednesday, but um, I didn't realise you'd work with Burt Reynolds. But actually, it's the one anecdote uh, we got, which it's one of those things you see on the internet pop up and someone goes, you'll never believe this, and they'll link you to an article from 2013. <laughs> um, see the Star Wars anecdotes, but it was on the last interview I did with him, uh, post its premiere in Sitches, where as I was doing this really crude setup for the interview with my camera on an espresso machine and using my phone in his pocket as a lav mic, because that's all I had to hand, and we had to get these extra pieces. 
uh, I said to him, oh, you know, to justify my actions of how crude my setup was, I said, oh, I'm, I'm doing a um, scotch tape and chewing gum approach, which I learned from Tommy Lee Wallace doing Pennywise and Fright Night. And he's like, oh, yeah, Tommy Lee Wallace. Oh, yeah, no, I remember him. Like, really nice guy. Yeah, we were throwing out leaves on the set of Halloween. I was like, shit, we didn't. <laughs> We've got all these other tidbits of you with James Cameron and Schwarzenegger and Henry Fonda and God as well. We have got to get that into the mix. So I, I did know it, but I'd completely forgotten it. And so when going through the edit, God knows how many times with Gary, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, we need to add this in, that in, that in. Um, when he when he said that, it just something twigged straight away, and it was almost just like hearing it for the first time again. Like Freddy Krueger worked on the set of Halloween. You know, all right, six years earlier, I know, but um, that to me, and and that's what I think I realized the documentary was. We we've certainly got a bit of a narrative about the pros and cons of being an icon, but I think the thing I'm starting to see people take away a lot, like yourself, is there's so many things I didn't know. It's like, well, let's just <laughs> ramp up that trivia. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, congrats on the film. I loved it. And, you know, I'm excited to see what you guys do next. Oh, thank you so much, man.